Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. It is a, a little bit of a dreary day today in, in Swepsonville. I, I usually wait to record this until I can get some good sunlight through the windows, and I'm not sure we're going to get that today, but it's still a uh, wonderful day to serve the Lord. We've got a craft show going on at the church. We'll have a baby shower tomorrow or today when you're watching this. Um, so it's just so good to, to be in the house of God, to, to uh, serve and praise God, uh, whatever is going on out in the world. So uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's spend some time in praise today. Would you uh, take a moment to, to center yourself? Uh, if you've got a candle, you're welcome to light it, and let's praise God uh, over these digital means today. This is a prayer for illumination. I hope you'll pray it with me. Open wide the window of our spirits, O Lord, and fill us full of light. Open wide the door of our hearts that we may receive and entertain thee with all our powers of adoration and love. Amen. And the scripture lesson, I'm, I'm going to read two scriptures. I haven't been in the habit of that here. But the first is just a brief reading from the book of Daniel. And if you know the book of Daniel, you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, who are captive in Babylon, and the, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, is demanding they bow down before the golden idol which he has made. Uh, this just is just a brief segment of that. This is Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, part of a larger text which you might, might pause and read if you would like. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O God, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then. Come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children... How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last will be first. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder... I wonder how this rich man thought this conversation would, with Jesus would go. I hope some of you out there plan conversations like I do. If you're in line at the drive-thru, right, you go through, well, I'll get a Big Mac meal with large fries and a McChicken, right? You, 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 you practice the whole spiel, right? And if you know you're going to visit someone, maybe you prepare conversation topics or even uh, anecdotes to tell. Uh, it might not seem like it sometimes, but I do a little preparation uh, to, to preach on Sunday, and I, I practice, right? I talk to myself. I, I sort of imagine. And when um, in in-person in worship, if I throw out a question sometimes, I sort of guess how it might go, right? I plan sort of the whole conversation. Now, a lot of times I get surprised. A lot of times the conversation does not go the way I expected. But we prepare. If you have to give someone uh, difficult news or if you have to ask someone to do you a favor, maybe you prepare exactly the way to ask it or exactly the way to seem the most sympathetic to get what you want. And so if this rich man got up that morning and knew he might see Jesus, I wonder if he planned what he would say. Or if he just came upon Jesus, I wonder if he had thought one day in the past, if I ever meet Jesus, here's what I'll ask him. And the thing about this conversation he has is the first part probably goes the way he would expect. He says, okay, I'm going to ask Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives a pretty predictable answer. He does say this thing, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But then he goes to the Old Testament. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. That might be what he expected. That would be a, a typical response for someone's question, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And so maybe he had prepared this answer. Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. I've done them all. This is where I wonder, how did he expect Jesus to answer? It may be, when saying, I've kept the whole law, maybe he expected Jesus to answer with incredulity. Really? Your whole life? You've never done any of these things? I mean, that's hard for me to believe that anyone could go through their life, maybe not murdering or committing adultery, but always honoring your father and mother, always, uh, you know, not coveting. Maybe he expected Jesus to answer with, really? But it may be that knowing Jesus is, is knowledgeable and seems to have inside information, maybe he expected Jesus to just give him a thumbs up. Good job. See you in heaven, right? Maybe that's what he expected. 
for Jesus to say, great job. See you there. Go in peace, right? Or maybe. And this is sort of where I'm inclined to think. I think he probably expected Jesus to make a few tweaks, a few uh, recommendations. I think he expected Jesus to give a little constructive criticism. Well, you could give a little more to the poor, right? You could give a little more. You could tithe a little extra. Or you could spend a little more time volunteering. Or you could sell a few of your more extravagant possessions. Maybe he, he expected Jesus to give him a few tweaks and then say, go on your way and do these. But it is clear he did not expect the answer Jesus gave. The rich man says to Jesus, I have kept the whole law since my youth. And what does Jesus say? Okay, just one other thing. Sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Jesus doesn't present a few tweaks. He doesn't give constructive criticism. Jesus prescribes a complete overhaul. Gut the house and build it from square one. Turn your whole life around. Sell everything you have and leave everything you have and follow me. That's Jesus' prescription. Change everything. It's no wonder this guy grieved. He was expecting a few tips and tricks or thumbs up. And instead, his whole life was turned upside down. And it's a hard message for us to hear, those of us who, who perhaps live in relative comfort. And it's hard for me to hear today. I mean, I mean, we're having a baby shower. I've got family in town, and I'm, I'm anticipating uh, having a, a bigger family to support, right? And so you start to think, well, do we have enough? Do we have enough saved? Do we have everything we need? What can I sort of buy to make this easier or purchase to make life smoother? And so here Jesus comes along, just like he does in the scripture for me, and says, you can't serve God and wealth and leave it all behind and follow me. I mean, that is a challenge. It will always be a challenge to anyone who, who owns very much of anything at all. But I think... I think the biggest challenge Jesus is offering and the biggest question he is bringing to this rich man is, who are you serving? Who do you serve? Do you really want eternal life? Jesus is pointing out a fundamental dissonance in this man's life. He comes to him as if eternal life is all he cares about. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's all I want. It's all I need. I've kept the whole law. And yet this guy has all sorts of wealth, all sorts of possessions. In Jesus' eyes, that reveals that he cares a little bit about this life. That part of him is hedging his bets and saying, well, I might as well live it up now just in case I don't make it to the next one. Jesus is pointing out that this man, as perhaps we all do, is trying to serve two masters, right? Serving himself in this life and hedging his bets, and also serving God when he has the chance. And Jesus' answer is, if you believe this, wouldn't you live a little differently? Here's the truth. I cannot tell you what our eternal life in Christ looks like. 
I don't know if there are pearly gates up there. I don't know if we'll see St. Peter up there. I don't know exactly what it will be, but the tradition of the church teaches me this. You don't get a report card. Despite the popular wisdom or the popular portrayals, when you uh, uh, pass on to the next life, no one's opening up your permanent record and saying, well, you stole a candy bar here, but you gave someone money on the side of the street here, and you, you did this person a favor, but you also spoke to them with anger. None of that. There's no binder you will be faced with in the next life, no report card where you get a B minus for being a good person and a, 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 a B plus for the meals you made. That's not how it works. The only question is who did you serve? The only question is, did you believe? Did you believe? And, and I can't tell you exactly what that means. I, I think belief can take a lot of forms. But what Jesus is pointing out for this man is belief is not just up here. We live our beliefs. Carolyn, uh, in church a few weeks ago, reminded us that faith takes practice. Well, along with that, what you practice is what you believe. If you believe that you uh, will protect your teeth and be able to chew into your 80s, you brush your teeth every day, right? Because you believe that. We saw it with COVID. If you believed in the virus, the way you lived your life changed. You wore a mask, you protected yourself, you tried to stay away from people. And if you didn't believe, you lived differently. The way in which we live reflects what we believe. And so this man can say all he wants. I want eternal life. I believe that God can grant it. But if he's spending a whole lot of time invested in his own mortal life, how hard can he believe it? Friends, this is what got Urban Meyer in trouble this week. I wouldn't tell you to Google it, but if you followed the news, you probably know that, that Urban Meyer is this typical college football coach, right? He talks a lot about responsibility and honoring your family and, and, and faith and responsibility, right? And in one moment, on one video, you at least have to question how deeply held those beliefs are, right? Now look, I believe in forgiveness, I believe in redemption. But if you see someone acting in the exact opposite way that they portray themselves, you have to question how deeply those beliefs are held. Does he really believe that stuff? If you believe something, it shows in the way in which you live. And we can take this pretty big. This is, this is one of the premises of the civil rights movement. Dr. King quotes all the time the Declaration of Independence, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and, and all men are created equal, to say we haven't quite perhaps lived up to those standards, or we need to apply them more broadly. I believe in these principles, and I believe they need to be lived out better. Your trust in God will show through in what you do. And that's why I, I thought of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego today. Because here they are, faced with execution, with being thrown into a furnace, with being tossed into the literal punishment that some of us understand uh, eternal torment to be, into a fiery furnace, and they say, that we will not serve your gods. We will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. They believe in the Lord. Even to risk their own lives, even to take their own chances, even to, to take a big chance. I think these words of Jesus... They're a challenge for all of us, especially those of us in the developed world who have more wealth probably than most of the people in Jesus' time and many of the people on the world today can imagine. 
I think we owe it to ourselves to be challenged by these words of Christ. Sell what you have and follow me. You can't serve two masters. It's harder for a rich man to get in heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But Jesus also says all things are possible with God. I wonder sometimes, do we believe that God has a, a future for our church? How would we live differently? If we really believed in God's eternal future, wouldn't we share the gospel a little more robustly than we sometimes do? Wouldn't we uh, be less embarrassed to talk about our faith in front of people who don't share it? Not all of us are faced with execution or living out our beliefs. But I believe we are faced with hundreds of choices every day to serve God or to serve ourselves, to serve some political agenda, to serve money. The starting point, the beginning, must be, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the eternal life he has offered me. I believe this is not it. I can't tell you what those cho choices are for you. But I believe I believe. And I believe that if we ask who we are serving, God will lead us to serve more faithfully. If we trust in the redemption of Christ, Perhaps we can be brave on the day when our faith is really challenged, when we are really faced up with that challenge of belief. So how do you let that faith shine through? How do you live your faith? Take a day and consider all the choices you make and ask not what would be most efficient or what would be the easiest or what would be the way I've done things, but what would serve the Lord It will not always be easy, and it may turn our lives upside down. But it's for the greater good of eternal life. And I pray that I may see it even today. Would you pray with me? Almighty Lord, help us to serve you in all we do, to know your love in every, every facet of our lives, and to not serve the other gods of this world. Lord, lead us to rejoice in your salvation that we may proclaim Jesus Christ to this whole world and share in your eternal life. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.